Hello and welcome to the Golf Club Design Studio. My name is Ralph Maltby and in the next few minutes we're going to go through some very interesting facts on golf clubs. One of the things being in the golf industry and like all of us whether we're club assemblers, club fitters or club designers, whatever we do in the golf industry, we seem to get sometimes caught up in this new modern technological world. And a lot of times we forget that we need to get back to basics in understanding what we're really trying to accomplish. Our ultimate goal is easy. It's to get people to play better golf. And to play better golf, from our standpoint, we want them playing better equipment, we want them fully understanding really why we've changed their equipment the way we have so that we can make these golfers into better players. So what I'd like to do in this, and I call this tips, tricks, and techniques. There's no real tricks to it, but there's a few tricks in how we present stuff and how we look at stuff so that it allows us to be more knowledgeable and demonstrations on how, why we're changing a certain aspect of someone's clubs and we can visually show them why we're doing that is very important. So tips, tricks, and techniques, golf technical information, sort of getting back to basics but a lot of new stuff and different ways to present things and I want you to look at the video and try to understand these different ways again of presenting what we're trying to accomplish in getting a golfer to play better golf. So with that said, let's get started, let's have a lot of fun, and let's look back at some of the things we know, but probably presented differently, and some of the things we really didn't know. You know, lie angle is one of my favorite subjects. And I can talk for an hour, an hour and a half just on lie angle. And you think, what can lie angle have that someone could speak for that long on it? Well, there's a bunch of different aspects on lie angle. And going all the way back to in the history of golf, when people would talk about lie angle is, well, gee, when the lie was, say, on a set of irons, too upright for an individual, meaning the toe was up in the air, that the heel would dig in, the face would slam shut, and the ball would go left. And then the same people that were perpetuating myths would say that when the lie was too flat for an individual and the toe dug in, the heel would come around and the ball would go to the right. Nothing could be farther from the truth. So rather than really getting deep into lie here where I can explain not only how we fit it and a little bit more on the myth and what really happens, I'll show you kind of what really happens because the point of this right now is to give you some visual demonstration aids that you can use with customers. It's very important to show people why lie is important. There's a bunch of different visual aids and I use a number of them here in the studio and I'm going to go through and show you all the methods that I have. Hopefully you will pick one of these methods and you'll use it when you're fitting individuals to explain to them the importance of lie angle. The other thing that the demonstrations do when you can show them a visual demonstration is it also helps them when they're out playing the game. What about when the ball's above their feet and they're on a side hill line? You're trying to explain to them the ball's going to go left off of that lie. Or if the ball's below their feet and you're trying to explain to them that the ball's going to go right. Why does this phenomenon occur? So a visual demonstration is the easiest way to show someone what's going to happen whether they're playing or whether their equipment is ill-fitted and the lie angles are wrong for them. So let's start off number one. And one of the things I used for years in all of my talks uh, to PGA business schools and also out onto tour schools and in fitting was to show people what happens when the lie is not correct. So what we're going to do is I've got a hole bored perpendicular into this number nine iron right here. And what I'm going to do is set it up right now to where I would be hitting the ball with the lie angle correct. And that is the sole radius is tangent at the center of its face as it goes through impact. Now that sounds easier to achieve than it really is because two things happen during the swing that allow the lie angle to flatten somewhat. That's why most toes are a little bit in the air from a driver all the way to a sandwich when you address the ball. The two things that happen are your hand position changes from address to impact because of the centrifugal force of the club. 
That's about a degree and a half, as much as two degrees flattening of the lie. The second thing that occurs is the shaft tends to bow down or bend a little bit, bowing the lie angle down, simply because the center of gravity of the head is not in line with the axis of the shaft. Therefore, a bending down moment occurs as you swing with club head speed through the ball. So you have those two things happening. The shaft's bending and your hand position's changing. So we're not going to go into how to fit lie right now in this demonstration because a lot of you do use the dynamic lie fitting method which is the board and the tape. But I want to go back to the visual demonstrations. So here I have the lie angle correct and here I have the lie angle where I've taken the lie angle out. Let's go back to correct a moment. Watch this demonstration. Just watch my hand movement while I do this. Let me go to way too... All I'm doing is changing the lie angle of the club. This leading edge of the club face is pointed straight at the target. I'm never changing that. All I'm doing is changing the lie angle. Now do you see the arc that the shaft that's in the hole in the face of the club is making? Now doesn't it stand to reason as you see this arc being swung that there is only one place, where, one lie angle rather, where you're going to impact the ball that's going to hit the ball on its highest trajectory, it's going to give it the maximum amount of backspin, and it's going to hit it the straightest. See, even if I tilt the toe up in the air at impact, now I've turned the trajectory down, I've increased a hooking side spin, I'm pulling it over to the left on the shot, so and it, I've lowered the trajectory. I've done everything on this thing that's wrong, so this is a variable that needs to get out of everyone's equipment. We need the lie angle coming through in this position at impact. Look at it this other way. If I take this shaft and I lay it down on the ground right here, I have zero degrees of lie in this club. Notice also that the leading edge of the face is still pointed at my target. But if I roll the ball up to this face, what's going to happen? Notice right now that it's going to be pulled. The loft angle that's on this 9-iron is the amount of pull going that way to the left. Notice also that we have no loft right here. So we have zero degree lie angle, we have a zero degree loft angle, but we've got a 48 degree, if this was the loft of this 9-iron, pull to the left angle. So the greater the loft on a club, the more important the lie angle is to an individual. So a little bit more of an explanation than I probably wanted to give because I'm trying to show you the demonstration devices, but it's sort of a passion with me. And when I get into lie angle and I see so many golfers out there that have improper lie angles and maybe someone hadn't taken the time to really fit them properly to it and getting the club coming through this way. And this is the only way, again, you're going to hit the ball with maximum backspin, maximum trajectory, maximum bite, and maximum, uh, what I said, trajectory. I'll just say it again. So now, let's go over to another little device here. And I want to show you this. This is a cute little thing I made up. You can make your own up. I may even put these on the market someday. Th this is another way that's a simple way to show someone. The hole in the face works perfect. And also I'll show you a little, there's a magnetic thing we'll put on the face in a second too. But here's a little device you can set down and actually show somebody and have a discussion with them while you're sitting at a table. And this is the same kind of a nine iron that I just showed you with the hole in the shaft. But it's a made up thing that sits on a table and all you do is you can take, and this is beautiful for always showing that the leading edge right here is always pointed at the target. All we're doing is tilting the plane. Do, do you know why there's this misdirection control angle to the right and the left when the lie's not correct? The reason is you have a loft angle on a golf club and you have a lie angle on a golf club. When you change the lie angle, you introduce a compound angle, a brand new angle. And that is easier explained as a tilting of this face plane. So you're tilting the face plane in the direction you're making the lie angle go either upright too much or too flat, which is the opposite when the, what the club head is. So right there, dead square face, and again I use my demo device and you can see it does the exact same thing as the club with the, the hole in the face, but it's just another way to demonstrate it. This is something you can make up. It's very simple, doesn't have to be very elaborate. Here's the, what I do with it. I didn't lose it. I found it. 
Here's the magnetic piece. And this is a little thing we, again, big sales pitch. We sell this in the Golf Works catalog. Make your own up. It's a magnet with a little piece of shaft coming out of it. Just sticks right on the face. So you don't have to drill a hole in somebody's clubs, which you wouldn't do anyway. But you can stick this magnet on and you can give them a demonstration when you're out on the range. This is the, the best portable device to have in your fitting cart when you're out on the range and you're showing somebody what lies about. Now I want to do one other thing here. When we talk about lie, you remember that I said the greater the loft angle, the more important it is to have the lie correct. A two iron, you don't pull the ball as much because you have less loft. But you hit it farther, but you still don't pull it as much. What about putters? So we have to put this in because everybody overlooks the putter. Here's a little demonstration. The best launch angle on a putter and to make into a putter is four degrees of loft. Proven on my high speed camera over here and when I do a lot of putter research analysis. Here's a four degree lofted putter with a bar per perpendicular into the face. So when I change this, would you look at the end of that? Look at the end of that rod. It's moving right or left. So. What it means to you basically is that on a 22 foot putt, if the lie angle is off by three degrees, say the toe is up in the air three degrees, which means the putter is too upright for the individual and needs to be flattened three degrees. If it's up three degrees and it's a 22 foot putt, you're gonna pull the ball an inch and five eighths to the left. Now, figure that all out on a four and a quarter inch or whatever the hole diameter is. I can't remember four and a quarter, four and a half right now, mental lapse, age thing. But if you're gonna miss the putt or lip it out only because you didn't set the lie angle correct on your putter. So when we do talk about lie angle being less significant on lesser lofts, and a putter only has approximately four degrees of loft as we mentioned, it still becomes very significant because you've introduced another error into your equipment that'll cause you to miss the shot. So once again, we got to take all those things out of a player's equipment that are bad that'll cause him problems. So I hope you found this kind of interesting. Make up some kind of a device. Show people. Help them play better. Let them understand why lie is important and then you'll be fitting more lie on golf clubs and the ultimate result, once again, is people play better golf. A subject that sounds very basic, but one that I really like to talk about is golf club length. Think about this for a moment. There are basically some factors that make a golf club harder to hit. The longer a golf club is, the less the loft a golf club has, and the stiffer a golf shaft that's in the golf club, the harder it is to hit. And I'll explain some of the other ones later, but let's start off right now with length. When you're talking about length, and you're talking about going out longer than normal than we sell today, and you're going to 48, 49, and 50 inches. When you're talking longer clubs, you're talking about it's harder to get the face on the ball, or the ball on the center of the face, if you will. So if you have a long club, which in theory, and it can because the long driving contests prove it, you can hit the ball farther. But two things occur. Number one, you can't get the ball on the center of the face very often, and therefore you lose a lot of energy because the name of the game is hitting the ball uh, its center of gravity to line up with the club center of gravity. The other thing that happens is poor directional control. You can't control the club head as well when it's very long and so you hit balls more right, more left, some high, some low. What we're trying to do is get the ideal length. And I want to talk about seniors, too, a little bit when we get done with this demonstration I'm going to do. We're going to have a little bit of fun with the demonstration because I've used that before. Many times there are articles that are written about, well, maybe everybody should have a 48-inch driver or a 49-inch driver. One of the things I caution everybody about is simply the fact that if something works for one individual, and heaven forbid it should be an engineer, then they go out and write these articles that is going to work for everybody. 
Well, I have things that work for me that I wouldn't let other people possibly do, and I'm sure all of you have things that possibly work in your game that you wouldn't go out and start trying to get everybody else to do. So we've got to look at length objectively, what it really does, and the facts. When we're out on tour, what's the average length on tour? The finest players in the world are playing drivers that are 43 and a half, Tiger Woods, that's pretty short. 44 inches, 44 and a half. Yes, there's a couple players playing 45 on the regular PGA Tour. The bulk of them are averaging around 44 inches on their driver length. You get out to the Champions Tour and you start getting a little bit longer. Why? Because seniors and people that have lost some of their distance want to hit it farther. And that's the only way they can do that. So there are some trade-offs. And always keep in mind one of my favorite sayings, and many of you have heard this that have heard me speak, is that everything in golf club design and fitting is some form of a trade-off. So what are we going to trade off? So with that, let me grab driver number one here. And I used this when I was out speaking a lot to PGA seminars and also to tour schools. And it's a great demonstration. Here's a six foot long driver. So I take this six foot long driver and I'm going to hit a ball. Well, and actually I have some of these clubs that are playable, and if you're going to make one up, you can take a flagpole from a golf course and fit it into some kind of a head and turn the end down and, and get this thing to work, but I uh, don't recommend playing with it. When I set this up like this, I'll tell you, see, I can't even control it. I knocked the ball off the tee because it's so long that I, it's just very unwieldy, so I put the ball back on the tee. So that's my number one problem. I'm getting ready to set up and hit this club, and I take this club back, and I take this club through, I am moving some serious club head speed. I'm probably going with a little bit lighter head because of that, but I'm going to hit that ball if I catch it on the middle of the face, and if I have my path and face angle at the right angle, square, a little inside out, little whatever I'm doing, then I'm going to get some great distance. Long drive contest players hit the ball a long way, and they all play extremely long drivers. That's not what we're trying to do out on the course. Actually, many of golfers are trying to hit it as long as they can on the course, but we've got to keep it in the fairway to score. I feel sorry for the guys that would go to golf schools and all they want to do is learn to hit the driver 30 yards longer. They don't really care where it goes, but they are not that interested in getting the score down. You've got to hit fairways to score. and We see that on television week in and week out with the PGA Tour pros. So the six inch driver obviously is very difficult to hit. And actually, the fact that this is six foot long, I will guarantee you that a single digit handicap on occasion will miss this ball. Because I'm a single digit and I've missed it using it actually trying to hit balls out on the range. So this club right here has some problems. It's generally inconsistent in solidness of hit, and we know that it's inconsistent in directional control because it's just too long to control the club. Now we move over to the other end of the ridiculous extreme, a 24 inch long club, two feet long. Now, this is really interesting because I can get down on my knees, I can tee this ball up anywhere in the United States on any golf course, and I can stand here and get ready to hit this, and I can wind up and bang that ball, and you know what? If I use impact decals, I'm going to impact the ball almost every time on the middle of the face. Why? It's so short, I can control exactly where I'm impacting the ball. And the other thing that's going to happen is, I can control the direction I'm going to hit it very well because of the shortness of the club. So I'm not going to miss any fairways. Now I may come up short at the fairways if they have grass between the tee and the fairway, but the point is I'm going to hit it straight every single time. The point of showing you the six foot driver and the two foot driver is this. Somewhere in between the length of these two clubs is the perfect length club for all of us. We only have to find that. And all I'm trying to do is caution you on the fact that we simply don't want to just keep going out to 45, 46, 46 and a half, 47. And there are OEM manufacturers out there that sell 46 inch length graphite shafted drivers as their standard length. 45 is getting better, but the problem with a 45 is still for most people, particularly those people that just can't control always hitting the ball on the center of the face, they're actually losing. They would gain more distance. Many, many golfers I've seen this happen to in fittings myself. At 44 or 44 and a half inches, the golfer hits the ball farther than his 45 or 45 and a half or 46. Why? Because he's not hitting it all over the face. He's moved it into more on the sweet spot of the club.
So that's something to think about on fitting length. And we really need to kind of get it in our heads that there's the right length for everybody. We know that, but we have to evaluate it. And when I mention senior players, the senior players have to do something. Once you start to lose 20, 30, 40 yards, you're getting up in your 60s, your 70s, and I'm unfortunately into my 60s now. As you start losing length, you can go longer. You, you have very little options. You can pick some lighter heads, go longer length, get out to 45, 46, try to get your length back, realizing that possibly you're going to start hitting it more right and more left. But the one advantage of when you go into a senior years and you are hitting it shorter, you're not spraying it as far right or left because you're not hitting it out there 260, 270, or 280 yards. So something to think about. But please take it very seriously when you're putting golfers into different and particularly longer lengths, length of golf clubs. Let's get them hit it, hitting it more into the fairway and more solid more of the time as our main objective. I've got a little gadget here that kind of falls under the tips and tricks area. And that is, this is a device that has a clicker in it and it tells you whether you're an early releaser or a late releaser of the club head during the swing. This is a swing right device. It's an old one I've had for a long time. You may find them still around, but there are a number of new ones on the market. The swing right unit was made in England. It was sold in the United States through the 70s and the early 80s, and then it, they're out of business and it kind of disappeared. But what's neat about it is it clicks, and it'll tell you as you swing, if you release early, it clicks out here. If you release late, it clicks down in here. And what that does is it helps the club fitter with understanding the type of shaft that he's going to kind of recommend for an individual. Kind of puts it in an area. Number one, if a guy's an early releaser and he's just whipping it through and he's generating his club head speed that way, you're generally not going to want to put him into a tip stiff shaft. You're going to want it a little more flexible in the tip area. But when we go ahead and we swing and we release extremely late, the guy's getting a lot more action out of the shaft. The head's ahead of the shaft, the face is closing, the lie is bending, he's getting a little more working out of the shaft. We want to go with a little stiffer tip section. Now, of course, we're fitting golf shaft flex by head speed, basically, and just watching the shot, and that's the easy part. But this is also a neat little tip and trick that allows us to look at where the release point is and then say, well, I think I want to go with a softer tip shaft or I want to stay with a firm shaft. So here's how this thing works. Now, let me give you a little demonstration. If I release early, it'll set, it'll click out here, and if I rele release late, it'll click down here. So listen and see if I can pull this off. And there you heard it click way in the back. Now I'll go ahead, reset it, and then swing with a late release. And there you heard the click down there. So really neat device. And there is a new one on the market right now. I don't know the name of it or where you can get it, but it'll be in all the catalogs and things probably pretty soon. But neat device to help you again in shaft fitting, and then possibly you may send that individual off to get a lesson if you're not a golf professional yourself. And he, you want to get him into a lesson where he learns to release later and gener generate higher club head speed. Neat little training device, something to consider. Most everyone out there knows how to fit grip size. And generally we fit it under the left hand and we do the thing where we're checking the, how close the fingers are to the palm. We're also watching the golfer hit shots. We're using the golfer's input as to, well, that grip feels too small, it feels too big. There are a lot of factors and we all do a pretty good job at fitting standard grip size or oversized grip size to an individual if we deem he needs it. One of the things that we overlook is the size of the grip under the right hand. And this is sort of a, a thing with me that I found that I get tremendous results by looking at the right hand grip size and generally making it approximately a 64th of an inch oversize from whatever I pick for the left hand grip size. In other words, if the left hand standard, the right hand is a 64th over. Doesn't work with all golfers, but it works for a lot of them. So another example would be if the left hand's a 32nd over, then the right hand is 3 64ths over. There's a gauge for this. I make a little gauge called right hand grip gauge. And what it does is simply you go down five inches, 
because the right hand is located approximately, the middle of the right hand is at five inches down from the top of the grip cap. So I take this gauge and I lay it on the grip and I check that I'm five inches down and I just shove it in and check it and I know this one happens to be exactly a 64th oversize under the right because it's a standard size grip and I put it on that way. When a golfer holds the club like this, as I said, and you measure down, you'll find that the middle finger under the right hand is at a five inches down. So when you're building this up, the technique is this. You're going to put an overlap wrap of tape, an extra overlap wrap of tape, from three inches to six inches, because five inches is the middle of the right hand. So when, you mark on the, when you're putting the tape on the shaft from three to six inches, you're going to put the extra overlap wrap on. That will give an extra 1 64th of an inch under the right hand. The reason we're doing that, and the reason I've had such success with this out on tour, and I have a number of touring professionals that go way back uh, that are doing this and have been doing it for years. And the reason you're doing it is, number one, the right hand feels more comfortable. It stays less active. You're not re-gripping as you go back on the back. So if it feels too small, a lot of times you'll re-grip. So you're not doing that. And also, it allows when you're putting this pinch right in here, to feel a little more that you have some right hand control coming through. So all I'm saying is it's something for you to try. It really works. There's a lot of players that we've done it with in our fittings at the Golf Works. We've taught it for years and a number of tour players use it. Try it. It works. One of the things that I do a lot in the golf club design studio is research and development on putters. What happens when a putter strikes the ball? I use high-speed photography. I have four putting robots in the studio. The first robot that I built was in 1995. And when I started doing testing on putters and hitting balls and trying to plot results, I found out that I wasn't getting anything consistent. And I started off using a wound golf ball. Well, you can't use a wound golf ball for, for precise putter testing because it's just not consistent enough. As a matter of fact, today's balls are far more consistent, but not all of them. So what I want to do here is show you a little thing about golf balls. When I have the master schools, and I teach the last day of the master schools here in the studio, I have every master student bring in a sleeve of three balls of their choice. And then we balance those balls to find out if they're on center or off center. A golf ball that's not, that doesn't have its center of gravity right in the middle of the golf ball, meaning it's not perfectly symmetrical, has a heavy spot. Well, if I take that heavy spot in one of my precision putting robots and I put the heavy spot to the outside and I hit the putt, the ball will go to the left and miss the hole. If I put the heavy spot to the right and I hit the putt, the ball will go to the right and miss the hole. If I put the heavy spot up or down or facing the hole, which is in the vertical plane, the ball will roll true into the hole if the robot's set up properly. So when I do this demonstration, it's a huge awakening for most people that see it. So let's talk a little bit about this because you're probably aware of taking a solution of Epsom salts and water and balancing golf balls. And Dave Pels has done this for years and has explained it very well. I'm going to take you a step further and show you three conditions that can occur when you balance golf balls. And believe me, when touring professionals come into the studio and I do this little demonstration, they definitely leave with a balancing solution so that they can check their golf balls. They're true believers. Now, in all fairness, most of the top grade golf balls that are built, the expensive balls, the highest quality balls, are very close to perfectly balanced. Occasionally, you'll find the odd one that's out a little bit. But again, I'm going to show you three conditions. However, as you move down the line on price, and it's not always dependent on price, but in this case, sometimes it is, you'll find some balls that are way out of whack and make it very difficult to putt properly with. Do you want to line up a 22-foot putt, knock it up there, and have it lip out on the right or miss two inches or three inches on the right, and it wasn't you? Again, you need to take every variable out of your equipment that's bad. And if a golf ball is out of balance, that's a variable that is bad. So first off, 
The Golf Works sells a kit, and this is not a sales thing to buy this, because you can make this up and pretty reasonable. We put it in a kit form because people simply won't do this. They go, oh, I've heard about that. I can take Epsom salts, put a bunch of Epsom salts into warm water, mix it all up until the ball floats, and then I can check it to find its heavy spot. Easy as pie. Dave Pels has told everybody how to do that. I've written it in my books on how to do it, but people don't do it. So we sell this little kit, and I don't even know what it costs. But in the kit, all you do is put hot water in it, you get a marking pen, you get instructions, and you get a bag of Epsom salts, and you mix it up with 16 ounces of water, and you end up with a solution just like this, that a golf ball will float in. So let's set that there, set our marking pen off to the side. Let's do a demonstration to show you what we're really about here. Now, a lot of you are saying, hey, I do that, but I got the less messy way. I bought the electric. This is a check and go. It works fine. I think it has a huge drawback for what I'm trying to accomplish, and that is it doesn't tell me how bad the ball is. It will spin basically every ball, even if it's just the minusculest out of balance, which doesn't affect anything really in the shot or the stroke, and you'll put a mark on this and then you'll play that mark. That's fine, but you'll never know on the balls you're using how bad or how good the ball is. And this you just simply hit the button and the ball starts spinning. And when it spins, it throws the heaviest part of the weight to the outside going around and around and around. And you put a dot on the top, then you take it out and put whatever marks on you want on the ball. And I'm going to show you the way I prefer to put marks on here in a minute. So this works. It doesn't tell me as much as I want to know. This method's a little messier, but once you mix this solution up, it lasts for a year or two, and you don't have to do it very often. So let's talk about the solution one so I can show you the three conditions that exist on a golf ball when you put it in. Okay, here's what we'll do. Let's get the solution out, opened up here, and let's just pick, I'm going to take two balls that I use, by the way, just in case you're curious, with all the robots that I have in the studio and all the testing that I do, there are only two balls I basically use. And that doesn't mean there are, every other ball is bad, but these two balls I found to be extremely consistent in roundness, weight, uh, size, the off-center, how they balance in the solution. So I use basically the Callaway Hex Red and the Titleist Pro V1. I can't tell you about every ball that Callaway makes down below that, nor what Titleist makes below that. But you'll be able to find out on the ball you're playing when you get done seeing this demonstration exactly how they balance out. But once again, I use the Callaway Hex Red and the Titleist Pro V1. I haven't used the Pro V1X because I don't have those in here, but the other, these other two balls give me extremely consistent putting results because they all balance out and I have not found as of yet a bad ball in either of those two brands on the top grade. So let's just take a ball and I'm going to start off and take a Callaway hex red and just throw it in. And we're not going to do any branding thing here and throw balls in and say, well, this is an awful ball, this is a bad ball. You determine all that on your own because I really can't tell you. Every once in a while, I'll find six or seven balls out of a dozen of what is considered a pretty top grade ball that are bad. But then when I go get another dozen, I may find two, and then the next dozen I find none. It's up to you to do it, and I would check it, and I'll show you why it means so much. So I'm going to take this ball, and again, when Dave Pels does his talk, he mentions that you can go ahead and put some jet dry, just a couple drops into the solution, and it helps the uh, surface adhesion and stuff on the, the surface of the water make the ball spin better. I've used jet dry, and I've not used jet dry. I really don't see where it makes a big difference, so we leave it out of our solution. Uh, you can use it if you want. Just so, again, backing up a little bit, this is Epsom salts. If you don't want to buy the kit the Golf Works has, you simply go into your drugstore, and it's very reasonable to get a half gallon size, comes in a milk carton, most of them, of Epsom salts. Simply mix it up with warm water. It'll take more of these salts than you think. It's a pretty good size hunk, as you saw from the bag that I lifted up. So I'm going to take and put this Callaway ball in. And one thing you're going to do, you always have a couple paper towels around while you're doing this. Okay, so I want to spin it, and I want to keep it kind of away from the edge of the container. So I've spun this, and I'm going to let it settle out to where it's settled, and then I'm going to take my Sharpie, 
my Sharpie pen and right where it's balanced out, I'm just going to put a little dot on the top and poke it down in the water. So I can see that dot. Now I'm going to spin it again. So I want to get the ball spinning and completely wet it on its surface in the solution. So now I have the ball spinning and this Callaway hex red has stopped and that dot that I just put on it is not facing up. It means that this ball is basically perfectly balanced. So if I put my dot on and the dot comes back up to the surface slowly, the same every single time, that means the ball is slightly out of balance. If I put my dot on and I spin it and the ball quickly comes back up to the surface, the dot comes back to the surface, vertical, just like, oh, some of you go back old enough to maybe not quite as old as I am, but it used to be a Joe Palooka doll. You punch this thing and it went down and it was heavily weighted in the bottom and it came right back up and you could punch it again. So it was kind of a punching partner. Same thing with these balls floating. So when I spin this Callaway here, I'm ending up with that dot coming up in multiple locations. So I could keep putting dots on all day long and the same one basically doesn't come up again. Ball is balanced. Once again, but if the dot comes up the same time, that same dot every single time, slowly, and we'll demonstrate that when I get another ball here. So one more time I'm going to spin the Callaway and look at it and there's no other dot. So I don't have to do anything to this ball now. That's condition one. I have a balanced ball. I got the teeniest little dot on it where it was on the first time and then wiping it off with water, the Sharpie leaves a dot that you can't even see. So you, you're welcome to mark this ball in any manner that you want by putting lines on it, which is the common thing for getting a ball to roll end over end. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. So let's take that ball out of play and let's go to the opposite end of the extreme. I'm going to put this ball in and I'm going to spin it and it doesn't care, matter what manufacturer it is. I just happened to have a ball here that's a great demonstration device. So I'm going to spin it. Okay, and it comes up and I'm going to put a dot on it. So I've got the dot on it and now I spin it again. And the dot comes right back up to the surface rather quickly. So I spin it again, and the dot comes right back up to the surface rather quickly again. This ball has a center of gravity that is off. Now what do I do? When a ball's off this far, I generally won't play it myself because it bothers me mentally. However, you can play this ball simply by leaving the dot right there, making your mark or whatever, and what you're going to do is when you putt this ball, or when you tee it up, now Ken, when you're in the fairway, you can't change it on iron shots, so there's going to be some factor, but generally on a full-blooded shot, like with a driver or with an iron, the ball will kind of self-correct pretty quick in the air. Uh, it's the putting that causes you the biggest problem, although I don't like a ball that's way out of balance. So this particular ball has a dot on it, and we know that it's quite a bit out of balance. Well, on this dot, I'm going to want to set it down to putt with the dot vertical, pointed back at me, pointed straight out, or pointed straight down. Either way, that's in the vertical plane, and that ball will roll true, and it won't be heavy on one side or the other. And if I leave the dot up, then basically, which is the way I prefer it, then you have the heavy part of the ball down. And you can see the dot, so you can always set it up. And then when you're marking the ball, you can take it, and there's a number of different marking devices on the, on the market, uh, there's the little cup you can put the ball in and draw around it. You've got this little device here where you can pop the ball into it, take a uh, Sharpie pen, and then you can just mark your line on it. So here's what I like to do. There are a couple methods. The method that I use is this method right here. When I, once I have found a dot, or if I have a perfectly balanced ball, I just put the dot anywhere I want that's convenient. I like to put a semi-heavy dark line on both sides of the dot. Then when I set that down, that's my lineup. You've seen a number of tour players on television that line balls up like this now. Oh, the <laughs> I just got salt watered. I can't believe I dropped the ball right in the drink. I gotta clean this up and then I'll continue in a Okay, I'm back, the mess is cleaned up. Did I tell you that I really recommended the electric unit? It's a lot less messy. Can't believe I did that. Anyway, where we stopped off was talking about the markings on the golf balls. 
The one I really prefer, and this is the one I use, and there are a number of people on tour that use the same one. Find the balance point, I'll put the dot on, and then I'll use the little device right here to go ahead and put the mark on that way and that way so I have it on both sides of the dot. Just a preference. There's another one that's very good, and there's your dot with a thin line on it. And then we also have the dot with a single heavier line on it. You can put a series of dots, you can do whatever you want to mark the golf ball. The one thing that I do like though is having a line of some sort on it. And here's basically, let me first tell you how the weight distribution works and again placing the ball. We've already talked about it a little bit. And then I want to tell you about how the ball rolls end over end and what this, this stripe can actually mean to you if you're not already aware of it. First off, when you set a ball down to putt it, and we talked about you can put the dot away from you, below you, toward you, you know, forget that. Generally just put the dot up and you've got the markings on the top and now when you strike the ball, the ball will roll straight. If I turn the line over the dot to the right, that means the heavy parts to the left and now the ball will tend to curve to the left simply because of being out of balance, if it is out of balance. If I turn the dot now over to the left here and that means the heavy spot is over here on my right. Now the ball will tend to curve going this way. So it tells you that in putting, you want the dot always up. And if you have the lines on it, you're obviously putting it up because you're using the lineup marks. Now on the lineup mark, what you do with the lineup mark is say your ball breaks 12 inches from right to left. When you set this down on the green after you've determined the break, set the lineup line to the break. Don't aim it at the hole. Set it to 12 inches to the right of the hole because it breaks 12 inches left. And just kind of line it up and then when you strike the ball with the putter and you don't have an inside out path or an open or closed face on the putter, you will then get the line to roll end over end and the ball will go 12 inches out to the right, start its curve and go in the hole. But it, the entire time, and as you've seen on the tour events with the great camera work they do today, the line is always going end over end even as it curves. So use that line to your advantage in number one, lining up your break, and number two, in finding out if your putter face angle and path are both square at impact so you get the ball rolling end over end. If you hit it and the ball wobbles, you're either inside out striking it with a closed face or outside in striking it with an open face or versa visa. But somehow you are not hitting the ball square. You're putting some side spin on it and that you don't want to do. So this has kind of been a I don't know, probably a little over lengthy discussion on balancing balls. So let's just recap one thing. When you balance the balls in the solution, there are three conditions that are going to exist. You're going to balance it, put a dot on it, rebalance it, put it and, look, and watch where that dot goes. And if that dot keeps not coming up to the top each time, then that ball is perfectly balanced. If the dot slowly comes back to the top in the same exact spot time and time again, then that ball is slightly out of balance. It's not real bad now, but you still want to use your mark and put your lines on it, but be sure you put your mark up when you putt. If the ball comes up rapidly to the same spot every time and the dot is up that you put on, that means the ball is out quite a bit. You can either elect not to use the ball, or if you use it, simply put the, the mark on it and make sure you're putting with the mark up or in the other positions we talked about, but not sideways, definitely up. So that's our recap, but put the lines on the ball, understand how all this works and how important it is, and again, whenever I get touring professionals in here, and even a number of amateurs, and particularly the students that are in the master school that come through and we test out three balls that they bring in, they all go back and decide that they're going to use some device, but they're going to find out where that ball balances so that they can go out and take that variable out of your putting that could cause the ball to miss to the right or miss to the left and it's not your fault. Working the ball is kind of a favorite subject of mine. A lot has been written about it and a lot of people talk about it. So I need to get my two cents worth in and kind of explain it so that you can use it also in fitting and working with golfers and trying to improve their game and getting them to better understand what working the ball really is. 
Working the ball boils down to basically two things. Altering the trajectory of your shot, either higher or lower, or hitting the ball right or left. Doesn't matter what your normal shot is, anytime you want to change it from your normal shot, you're basically going to be working the ball. We'll talk in a moment about different equipment and what different design does to working the ball, but let's just get a better understanding of it. First of all, if I'm going to hit the ball higher or lower, and I'm not a teacher and don't profess to be, but basically there's four things that are going to influence the trajectory on a shot. Your hand position, the ball position, your swing plane, and your release point. Those are the four basic things that are going to alter height up and down. And of course, I should put skill level in there because the better you are and the more, the more you can get it up or get it lower or do funny things with it. When we talk about hitting it right or left, we're talking about two things. The path the club head comes into impact and the face angle of the club at impact. Face angle is a bigger influencer of ball direction than is path. But the two of them together are big influencers in the fact that they create possibly a hooking side spin or a slicing side spin. Or they create no side spin and the ball basically flies straight, whatever the face angle is at the point of impact. So let's, I don't want to make this too complicated, but let's think about this a little bit. If I am swinging into impact and I have a two degree inside out path, I'm coming in inside on my path to impact and my face angle is perfectly square to the target, where's the ball going to go? The ball is going to start off square to the target, maybe ever so slightly left if you want to get technical, but it's going to draw some because you have your face angle closed to the path. Path is two degrees inside out, face is square, therefore the face is closed to the path. Simple concept. Another example, we're swinging outside in and the face is square. Where's the ball going to go? The ball will basically start off just straight for the most part and then will tend to slice just a little bit to the right because the face now is open to the path. A two degree outside in path, face angle square. That's a two degree differential. Now let's say that we are coming in two degrees inside out on our path and the face is close two degrees. The ball will start off approximately two degrees left of the target and it will hook. It's a little beyond the draw stage. Why? Because when you have a two degree differential between path and face angle, you're into a draw or a, or a fade. When you've got a four degree differential between path and face angle, now you're into hook or slice. And when you've got a six degree differential between path and face angle, now you're into snap hook or severe slice, banana ball, whatever you want to call it. So once again, if I'm two degrees inside out, with a two degree closed face at impact, the ball starts off two degrees and it hooks quite a bit because my face angle to path is a four degree differential and my face is closed by four degrees to the path. So now you should be starting to understand this a little bit and again, I probably need 700 drawings up here on the screen to show you all these things. Read it in my books. In the uh, fitting book that I've done and also the golf club design, the Bible thing, it's all in there. And you get a good understanding of the nine ball flight possibilities. Because of various face angles and paths, they can create nine possibilities. Let me give you one more just to show you this. You're thinking, how can there be nine? But there are. What if I'm swinging two degrees inside out on my path with a two degree open face? The path and the face angle are square. They're, they're together. There is no differential. Two degrees inside out, two degree open face. You know where the ball's going to go? The ball's going to start off two degrees to the right of center, and it's going to go straight as an arrow. But it's not going at the target. So that's one of the ball play. That's the push. And that's one of the ball flight possibilities. So working the ball, we change the trajectory. We can change our left or our right to various degrees by how we handle face angle and path. Now we get to the design part of the equipment. And in the design of the equipment, a lot of people like to think that, well, as I move the center of gravity farther out from the hosel of the club, i.e. generally a higher playability factor, that it's harder to work the ball because the club head's harder to turn. 
Well, it is a little bit harder to turn because the closer you've got the center of gravity into the heel, the harder it is to control for the average player, hence a lower playability factor. The farther you get the center of gravity out from the hosel, it's harder to make the head move, but that's not important. That's actually stabilizing the club more. And all players, whether you're the poorest player or the best player, you adapt to that immediately when you switch to new irons. Let me give you a good example of this. Craig Stadler, as most of you know, maybe not most of you, but I do, I did all the designs for Tommy Armour Golf Company. The entire line that's in there are clubs that I've designed here in this studio. So we have basically three players on tour, Stadler, Corey Pavin, and Paul Goidos. Well, as you know, Stadler, as he went over to the senior tour and also last year he won on the regular PGA tour, Stadler's won four or five events right now. Well, Craig Stadler played the old V31 ROs. ROs stood for Reduced Offset, Tommy Armour Golf Club. It was a slight cavity black. It was in the Evo line. Well, it was my job to get him to convert over into the new stuff. Well, the V31 RO had a center of gravity back toward the hosel. It had a rather high center of gravity, and Craig Stadler played pretty good with those irons. So when I came out with the new 845Cs, those are the cavity models. It's a brand new model. It's a longer blade and made up a perfect set for Craig Stadler. And he gets it out there and he sets it down and goes, well, you know, this is a little longer than what I normally play. Well, it's only a few shots and a couple days worth of work and all of a sudden, bam, he's hitting it exactly straight. And one of the reasons for going into this new model was that it was too multi-playability factor categories higher than what he did play. The V31 ROs were in conventional, which is down in here, let's say, and the new 845Cs are in super game improvement. Two categories. Two categories is huge. Now, what's the basic differences in playability in those two irons? The basic difference is when Craig switched to the 845C, the center of gravity from the hosel horizontally across the face was moved out 150 thousandths of an inch from the old V31 ROs. The center of gravity vertically up the club was lowered 80 thousandths of an inch from like 783 down to 703. So he's playing with hugely, vastly different playability factor irons. And the neat thing is he started winning with them and in one of his comments, in Michael Johnson's column in Golf World, he was quoted as saying, I'm now hitting the ball so close that it's scary. If I could only putt, who knows what I'd shoot. And that was kind of a quote, pretty close there. So do I take full responsibility for Craig Stadler playing better? No, I take full responsibility for convincing him to go into irons. Not my design. There are other irons that play up in super game improvement. But to get him to move up because his play is going to improve simply because he's hitting the ball better, straighter, and more accurate than he ever was. So once again, all it's going to take him is a little bit of time out on the range and he's working the ball just like he always has. There's no difference in Craig working the ball with the V31 ROs versus the new higher playability category, two categories up, 845C irons, simply from the standpoint that Craig is adapted to them. He's using path and face angle, uses all the things that he's always used to hit the ball higher or lower. So there's no secret in how to do it. And don't let people convince you that as you move the CG around, you now can't work the ball if it's too far toward the toe or you can't. There's tons of people out there playing Callaway golf clubs. They all work up into the ultra and super game improvement categories. There's a Cleveland TA5, that's a, and the TA7 is a good club. They're up in the super and ultra game improvement categories. Well, people are playing those irons, and they're working them just fine. So don't let this working thing get you into thinking that, well, the design of the club, this is harder to work, this is easier, this material's softer, the ball stuck on the face. What I always tell everybody about the soft materials on clubs, when you feel that ball is stuck on the face so that you can work it, you better do it quick because it's only on there five ten thousandths of one second. Here's a little bit of information that's very interesting. Wherever the center of gravity in an iron is located horizontally on the face, whether it's in the heel, toward the center, whether it's a longer blade and it's moved out, the player will find that center of gravity location. Why? Because it's the most solid place
to impact the ball on the face. That can be the poorer player am playing amateur all the way on up to the Turing professional. The Turing professional will find the center of gravity and generate a nice little wear spot around it. The poorer playing amateur will have kind of a bigger ellipse over there, but they will all center around the center of gravity. And this I've proved numerous times with all the Turing professionals clubs that have come in, that we've rechromed, that we've worked on, and I have photos of this in my new book on multiplayability factor. Very interesting. And keep that always in mind that the player will impact the ball where the center of gravity is located because it produces the most solid, consistent shot.